like to see this number assembled with us. Appreciate the presence of those of you who have come from other congregations in the area to be with us in this series of services to study with us in the Word of God. This evening is the basis for our study together. I'm reading from the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians, beginning with verse 1 and reading the first six verses. But the Apostle Paul said, I therefore the praise of the Lord to seek you, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, for bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. In these verses, the Apostle Paul is sitting, setting forth the Lord's plan for religious units. We're living in a day in which there is a great deal of interest in the subject of religious unity, both in and out of the church. We see those of the denominational world, they are, they think, quite concerned about religious unity. And as a result, we're seeing all kind of mergers. Uh, take place among the denominational bodies, religious bodies merging and sometimes changing their names, and new ones are appearing on the scene and somebody will raise the question of what, what is this body? Well, this is a religious group that has merged, maybe making or uh, coming from two or three former religious bodies. And then we see kind of a renewed interest in the body of Christ in recent uh, years about religious unity. I never have understood why the people allowed or had a, a way of letting time be the determining factor as to what they were enthusiastic about so far as what the teaching of the Word of God is concerned. I don't know why that in 1975 the people ought to be real enthusiastic about the Lord's Supper. 1976, they're real enthusiastic about baptism. 1977, they're real enthusiastic about unity. 1978, real enthusiastic about conversion. But this seems to be kind of the extreme to which uh, some brethren at least have gone uh, in times past. That they are of the nature and disposition that they get on one subject, they have one kick, and while they're on the merry-go-round of that kick, you think that that's all the Word of God talks about. And then when the, that kind of cools down and dies down, then they get on another binge, and here they go on that one for a tear. And their interest wanes in that, and here they go again. And um, about every time you see them, they, they've got some new idea going. I've never understood why that a person couldn't be balanced in his thinking. Be just as interested in the Lord's Supper, just as interested in spiritual gifts, just as interested in conversion, just as interested in baptism, and just as interested in Bible unity all of the time because it's a Bible subject, because it is the will of God. But since we are in a period of time at which at least brethren to some degree are supposedly interested in it. And there's a great deal of misunderstanding and false teaching that's being done. I want to look with us this evening 
concerning the platform or the plan that God has for religious unity. We're not interested in the plan that men may have in order that men might be united. Man has achieved all kind of plans. He has suggested all kind of plans. We're not interested in those. We're interested in the one that the God of heaven has set forth that read about upon the pages of his word. And it is suggested for our consideration in these verses from the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians that I've read in your hearing this evening. I want to suggest that first of all that in this passage, that the Apostle Paul says that there is one God. I doubt that it would be, in fact, it would be impossible to find an individual that would say, well, I believe that we ought to worship, but I believe we ought to worship a multiplicity of gods. Everyone that, that we encounter, at least in this land, believes in one true and living God. And yet there are those in the world that they do not believe in the God that you and I worship. And yet there is a difference, there are divergent views as to who is the object of our worship in the world. There are those that would worship Buddha or Zoroaster or Allah or others of the gods of the Orient. In fact, it may interest you tonight to know that there are probably more people in this old world that worship some god besides the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob than there are that worship Jehovah God. It just so happens that the most of the people that you and I know live in these United States and worship God. If you wanted to worship Buddha, you'd probably find a hard time finding a shrine to Buddha in Camden, South Carolina. But there are places in this old world that that's not one of the religions, but that's the religion. So in order to be united in worship, how are you going to unite the people of earth in worship? Well, Paul says that there is one God, and that's suggesting to us the idea of the unity of worship. Everyone worshiping the one God of the Bible, Jehovah, then mankind is united. Mankind worships the gods of men, then this is what brings about religious division. We're divided over the gods of men. We're not divided over the God of the Bible. We need to have emphasized for our consideration that the Bible says that not only is there one God, but the Bible says that there is but one God. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul and Demons, the matter of idolatrous worship, as related to some matters in the church of Corinth, Paul said that there are gods many and there are lords many, that is, that are called God, but to us there is but one God. You couldn't get any more in the than stating that there is but one God. And so unity of worship is suggested for our consideration when Paul says that there is one God. But notice also in this uh, statement that he says in verse 5 that there is one Lord. And that suggests unto us that there is unity in all parts. Right here is one of the fundamental differences in the religious world concerning the worship to God and 
what is done in the religious world. Paul says there is one Lord. That is, there is one Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you were to ask a person, what Jesus Christ do you follow? They would probably think, well, that's a strange question. But the Bible affirms that there is one Lord, also affirms that there is one God. And the Bible that affirms that there is one God affirms that there is one Lord. Just as one God suggests to us unity of worship, one Lord suggests the idea that we're united in the Father. That is, that we all submit under the authority of the one Lord Jesus Christ. Right here is the basis of what the religious world uh, looks at as unity. Here's why the religious world is not united. They are not united because they do not recognize one universal standard of authority. And this is the basis of all religious unity. I want to read in connection with this a statement that Jesus made in John 17 when Jesus in that intercessory prayer unto the Father prayed. He said in verse 20, neither pray after these alone, speaking of the apostles. Uh, but he said, uh, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Here is the word, and Jesus said it is their word, it is the word of the apostle. And they're going to believe on me, Jesus said, through their word. Now here's what Jesus is praying for that they all may be one, as thy Father are in me, and I in thee, that they may be one. Why? What's the purpose of that? <laughs> that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Jesus, in this passage, suggests unto us that the source or the way that they will be one is through their word. That is the word the apostles preach. That's the basis of apostolic unity, the word of one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're hearing a good bit today about that we ought to be united on the person of Christ. But Jesus did not say that they may believe in me through me. But Jesus said that they may believe in me or on me through their word. The word of God, the word preached by the apostles of Jesus Christ. This is the basis of religious unity. Specifically, among brethren tonight that are trying to advocate a united effort is a movement that is being spearheaded by some fellows by the name of Leroy Garrett and Carl Ketcherside and Edward Fudge and some others trying to get brethren to be united. They want to unite brethren around the idea of the Lordship of Christ, and you forget about what he has said in his word. If we just believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It doesn't make any difference about anything else. You eat the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day or don't. If you have instrumental music in worship or don't. If you preach premillennialism or don't, that does not mean that these issues may not be or should be discussed a little bit and looked at a little bit, but they're not necessary in order to have religious unity. You don't unite on the Word of God, you unite on the person of Christ. 
And that's not the basis that the Lord set forth in his word. Jesus said that you'll believe on me through the word that the apostles preached. And the reason why that the religious world is not united, the reason why brethren are not united, is because that they will not take just what the Word of God says. Now we hear a lot about in the church tonight people saying, well, you know that's just your interpretation. I get a little bit sick and tired of hearing people say, that's just your interpretation when all you do is read to them out of the book of God. My interpretation of Mark 16, 16, for example, is, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, what have I interpreted about that? What have I said about it? I just read what the Word of God said. Well, I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came to gather to break, uh, uh, when the disciples came together, or rather, in Acts 27, when they came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. What is there about that that is my interpretation? That's just a plain declaration of Scripture. Or as Paul said to the saints of Corinth, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him. Somebody says, well now, that's just your interpretation. The New Testament church didn't have a church. Well, if that doesn't establish that it did, I don't know what... Uh, it would take to establish that it did. And you'd just go on and on and on, naming other things that you uh, could. But here's what the Word of God says, and when you read it, somebody pops up and says, well, that's just your interpretation of it. No, that's not my interpretation. That's exactly what the Word of God says. Since I've been here this week, I talked with a lady... And I told her what the Word of God said, and she said, well, that's just your interpretation. No, that wasn't my interpretation. That's what the Word of God said. I read it to her. Right out of the Word of God. I didn't say anything. Several years ago when I lived at Murphy's brother, there was a lady that lived right behind me. And that was discussing the Word of God with Jehovah's Witnesses. And she invited me over one afternoon to sit in her living room and talk the Word of God to these uh, folks. And so they came over this particular afternoon and they said, uh, well, since uh, a preacher's here, said, uh, do you believe that uh, this earth is going to be destroyed, burned up? I said, yes, sir. They say, we'd like for you to show us from the Bible what the Bible thinks. And I said, be glad to. And I just turned to 2 Peter chapter 3 and just read the whole chapter. When I got through, I said, now I want you to look at something. I said, I want you to look at this statement in this verse. I said, verse so-and-so says this. Then I said, look at this statement here in this verse. Verse so-and-so says this. And I picked out about four or five or six statements out of that chapter. I just said, here is what is in verse so-and-so, and it says this. When I got through, I said, now that's what I believe about it. One of them looked that up and said, oh, that's your interpretation about it. I said, what is? They said, what you just got through saying. I said, what this verse here, is that my interpretation? Well, no. I said, is this what this verse says my interpretation? Well, no. I said, what is it that's my interpretation? Well, they weren't exactly as interested in discussing that subject as they thought they were. And we got a lot of brethren that when they just flat don't want to do what the Word of God says, if they don't want to meet on the Lord's Day, just don't let them meet on the Lord's Day. Just stay home. 
if they don't have any more faith in the Word of God. But don't come telling us that the Word of God does not teach that you eat the Lord's Supper and you contribute out of your means and you worship God on the Lord's Day. If the Bible teaches anything, it teaches that. And if it doesn't teach that, then you might as well open that window over there and throw all the Bibles out and forget about serving God. And that's one of the problems that we're having is everybody has got their idea of how you ought to be united. Jesus said the standard the place of the unity was their work. But notice the purpose of this unity. Jesus said that they might all be one. As thou, Father, art in me, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. What's one of the purposes for this unity, for this oneness? Is that the world might believe. There's not any greater source of infidelity in the religious world than a divided people claim the fall of Christ. You know, one of the greatest sources that Satan uses to convince people that there's not any things of the religion of the Lord is he says, well, look at all the division that exists among those that are trying to follow the Lord. Here's a fellow over here, he says he's following the Lord, and he's doing this. And here's a fellow over here, and he says he's following the Lord, and he's doing that. And here's another fellow over here somewhere, and he's claiming to follow the Lord, and he's going another direction. Here's another fellow over here, and he says he's following the Lord. They're all saying they're following the Lord, yet they're all headed in different directions. And you know, if there's anything at all, that ought to cause me. To, to be very dark, be very careful. When I start acting in such a way to call the saints of God, not to be you know. When I try to interject something into the service of God that is going to divide bread, cause, going to cause bread to be divided. That's going to be the cause of alienation among brethren. I need to be very careful because what I'm going to do, I'm going to help people understand that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. Because Jesus said that one of the things that unity would do, it would cause people to believe that the Father in heaven sent him. And I need to be careful about causing trouble, causing division in the body of Christ. There's a lot of folks in the church, evidently, that they don't think much about this. That they, that they seemingly get their kick. That they get their pleasure out of just creating <clears throat> and stirring up and uh, causing an undercurrent. They don't have anything worthwhile to contribute. They don't stay at home and study the Word of God in order that when they come to a Bible class that they might be knowledgeable in the Word of God to be beneficial. But Brother So-and-So is teaching class, and here's the passage. Let me see what kind of question I can raise to uh, cause some disturbance next Lord's Day. Well, we got through that one. Well, I didn't get too much of a stir out of that. I see the next paragraph. What can I find there that I can take off on? And it seems like that there is an attitude that not of trying to help, but just trying to, to, to stir up. An attitude of resentment. An attitude of rebellion. An attitude to try to do anything to disrupt the tranquil, peaceful, harmonious working of God's people. Now when the, you do that, Paul, Jesus said, that one of the things you're doing to keep the strong and the Pharisees being an answer to you, help you to convince people that Jesus is not the Son of God. You don't have to go out and say, well, now, you know Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. 
to convince people that he's not. You just be a uh, instigator of division among the people of God. And when you do, that's exactly one of the consequences of what. You know, another factor about this is that Paul says that there is one law, that's unity of authority. When I recognize one Lord as unity of authority, he is my authority, and that's what I preach. You know, sometimes people say, well, why doesn't so-and-so preach more from the Word of God? I mentioned a moment ago, living in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, several years ago, and one day I was down in the bank, and a banker friend of mine there said, uh, Tom said, I want to ask you something. He said, you know, said, where I go to church, and he went to one of the churches of Christ today. He said, uh, our preacher just doesn't preach much from the Word of God. said, for example, last Sunday, he said, uh, the topic of his uh, sermon was Gene Bragg. Well, I knew what uh, passage in the Word of God that he took his text from. Here's Matthew 35 and verse 15. He said, I want to know why he would preach on something that's not even in the Word of God. I said, you want me to really tell you why Lehman preached that sermon? And why that this is not the first time that you uh, told me about his preaching? He said, yeah, I'd really like to know. I said, I'll tell you exactly why. Because he just flat doesn't believe the Word of God. That's the reason why he doesn't preach it. That's the reason why the denominational world tonight doesn't preach the Word of God. They don't believe it. When Max and I were at Reed Hardeman a number of years ago. I had a class... It was called the Preparation and Delivery of Sermons. Our textbook was uh, that same title, written by old Dr. John A. Brooks. If I remember correctly, was a professor at the Southern Theological Baptist Seminary in Louisville. Now, I don't know whatever happened to the textbook, but he made a statement in that book that has stuck with me through the years. He said, if you want to preach on a subject that you cannot find the text to read, so get you another subject. You don't have a Bible text. Now, I don't know whatever happened to the textbook, but he made a statement in that book that has stuck with me through the years. He said, if you want to preach on a subject that you cannot find the text to read to get you another subject. You don't have a Bible text. And you know, that's pretty good advice. One of the things that I guess I have observed about my own preaching, if I can be critical of my preaching, that I don't know how to preach. If I can't get in the pulpit, and when I begin to preach, to read a passage of Scripture, this idea of just getting in the pulpit and just taking off talking, now, I don't know how to do that. Why? Because here's the standard of authority. Here, here's what we're supposed to preach. Here's what we're to be governed by. Here's what we're going by. And this is one of the problems that we're having in the church with this, as it's sometimes referred to as unity movement, or the grace fellowship movement. We've got a lot of fellows that they know more about what Alexander Campbell said than they know about what Paul said. 
They know more about what Barton W. Stone said than they know what the Apostle Peter said. They know more about what some other maybe theologian said than they know about what Jesus Christ said. And I have detected, as I've listened to some of these fellows that I've mentioned earlier in the lesson, in some of these unity forums here yonder and elsewhere across the country, and read some of their writings, that they have the idea that if they quote Alexander Campbell, they prove something. They haven't proved anything to be scripture. That if they can quote what Barton W. Stone said about a matter, that's the end of all wisdom. And it's not. And they have the idea that if we have been able to go back and restore what they call the restoration movement, that we have arrived, and we haven't. I'm not interested in restoring the restoration movement, as it's called in this uh, country, as known in church history. What Alexander Campbell did a century and a half ago, what other brethren did a hundred years ago, I'm not interested in restoring what they did. They made mistakes then, just like brethren today are making mistakes. But well, what I'm interested in doing is preaching just the Word of God. And if you're going to restore anything, look at the Word of God, go back and restore the apostolic church. Restore the church of the Bible under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's all I'm interested in restoring. I'm not interested in getting the church of Camden to be like the one up at Brush Run or to be like the one at Lexington, I'm interested in it being one that is fashioned after the church that you read about in the Word of God. And that's one of the problems that, that we have. There are too many folks in the Church of Christ that have not learned that Jesus Christ is their authority, or at least he ought to be, and not what men say. I'm reading too many uh, writings of brethren that they think that when they quote some man, they've established some, and they don't even quote the Word of God. I have a track in my library uh, on a uh, subject that probably is not too live here, but in some sections of the country, it's quite a live subject. Written by a gospel preacher. And he quotes in that track what the denominational commentator Barnes said about something, and what Meyer said about something, and what I believe Adam Clark said about it. He quoted at least four or five denominational commentators as what they said about the passage. Well, I don't care what some commentator said about it. He'd be just as wrong about it as he can be. And I'm not opposed to reading commentaries. I have some of them in my library. But a gospel preacher would not think about quoting denominational commentators to prove what baptism is. We need to go back to the Word of God not only for salvation, we need to go back for everything that we do and preach and teach in religion. If I teach anything in religion, I cannot turn to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and say, here's what the Lord says about this. This is what the Lord taught on that question. Or this is what the Lord taught his apostles to say. Then I don't have any business preaching. I don't have any business advocating. Because I've got the wrong authority. And you know, it makes a great deal of difference. Jesus one time raised the question concerning the Jews. They came to him. And they had a question. He said, I'll ask you a question. You seem to be interested in this question of a part of the baptism of John. Whence was it? From heaven or me? It made a great deal of difference where the baptism of John came from, whether it came from heaven or whether it came from me. And it makes a great deal of difference, brethren, where a thing comes from today. Did it come from heaven or does it come from me? And I don't care what the question is. You can just sum it up. Any question you want to raise, 
You can draw, take the sheet of paper, draw your line down the center and put on one side of heaven, on the other side men. And you can find the answer to whatever you're teaching. It either came from heaven or it came from men. If it came from men, it doesn't make any difference. The only thing that makes any difference did it come from heaven. If it came from heaven, then this is what we should be concerned about. Now, I recognize that in the lesson tonight, I've spent more time on this one point than I will on any of the others, but this is the one that's important. If you do not have a standard, a common standard of religious authority, then you'll never be united. And this is one of the reasons why the brethren will never be united with a lot of other brethren, because some brethren want to hold the Word of God and other brethren don't. There are a lot of brethren that don't even believe the Word of God. I listened to one of these fellows as they are sometimes described as a young prince. I listened to one of them here a while back talk about that uh, Matthew recorded a Jesus, and Mark recorded a Jesus, and Luke recorded a Jesus, and John recorded a Jesus. And he said, now my problem is I don't know which Jesus to believe in, the one that Mark told us about or the one John told us about. Well, a fellow has got that attitude toward the Word of God, he doesn't believe the Word of God. He's a modern. He's an unbeliever. What Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John said about Jesus Christ all harmonizes. Well, one of them is not presenting one account and another another account. But this young fellow, he had his Ph.D. degree, appeared uh, in an assembly of people that claimed to be New Testament Christians. And he thought that he was really qualified to instruct them in religious matters. He didn't know enough to instruct them in religious matters. He needed to be uh, seated and let somebody try to convince him that the Bible was the Word of God because he didn't believe that it was. And he can claim, oh, I believe the Word of God. But when a man gets up and says, John tells about one Jesus, and Matthew tells about another, he doesn't believe the Word of God. And that's just some of the problems that we've got uh, among us tonight. But let's look at another statement that's made here. Paul said not only is there a one Lord, but he said that there is one faith. That suggests unto us that there is unity of message. Unity of message. People did not talk in New Testament days, what faith are you? There was but one faith. The same Bible says there's one God and there's one Lord says there's one faith. And it would make as much sense to walk up to a fellow and say, what faith are you? Uh, as you would say, what God do you worship? When all men are preaching the one faith, there is unity of message. There is unity of that that is preached. When you hear one fellow preaching one thing on one street corner and somebody else preaching another thing on another street corner and somebody else preaching something entirely different on another street corner, it's just obvious they're not preaching the same thing. Somebody's wrong about what they're preaching. But look at it again. Paul says that not only is there one thing, what he says is there is one body. That suggests to us unity of organization. All churches were organized. They were all alike. The idea of the New Testament was there were elders and deacons in every congregation. You don't read in the New Testament of one church over here having elders and deacons, another church over here having a synagogue, and another church over here having a convention. Some other church over there being governed by a conference. You had unity of organization. They, there was one organization. That was the church. That was the body of Christ. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of the uh, body, a lot of the organizations that men uh, make today, 
You do not read in the Word of God a body pure. Now, if you've got the body of Christ, you've got the church. Then you've got a human organization over here. That's at least two bodies, and that's one more than the New Testament knows anything about. The New Testament knows of one body, unity of organization. And when one organization, one body, that's all you read about in the New Testament. When you have two, that's more than you read about, and you got one more than you need, and you need to get rid of the one that you don't need, and that's not the church of the Lord. You know, I've observed something, brethren, through the years. That the institutions and the organizations that men build, they think more of them than they do the church of the Lord. Now you let me show you that so. I don't know where it is around here in the Carolina somewhere. There's uh, a few of these institutions. You probably could find an old folks home or an orphan home or some of these organizations like that. You crank up your mimograph machine and start criticizing that organization see how brethren turn on it. While they'll fight your teeth and toenail. But you crank your mimograph machine up and start talking about this local congregation that's of Christ. They won't say a thing about it. I've observed that through the years. Criticize the church of the Lord, just pick out any local church you want to and start demeaning it and saying every unkind and ungodly thing that you can. You don't hear brethren come to the defense of that, but they'll come to the defense of the institutions that they uh, fostered and that they built. That ought to tell us something about where their allegiance and where their heart is. They think more of the institutions that they have concocted and given birth to than they do the, the institution that Jesus Christ shed his blood for. Paul not only said that there is one body, he also said that there is one baptism. That suggests that there is one that there is in the practice. In New Testament days, you do not read of one congregation doing one thing and another congregation over there doing something altogether different. And Paul wrote to the church of God at Corinth in chapter 4 and verse 17 and chapter 7 verse 17 to say he taught the same thing in all the churches. Whatever Paul taught at Ephesus, you don't have to find it specifically taught in a, a Corinthian epistle. That's what he taught over at Corinth. You see that in 1 Corinthians 16. Paul said, uh, writing in the church of Corinth, now concerning the collection before the sun. As I've given order to churches of Galatians, what are you going to do about over Corinth? Even so do ye. Well, I don't read in the New Testament about elders and deacons of the church at Laodicea. I cannot read in the New Testament about elders and deacons in the church at Philadelphia. But I wouldn't hesitate a minute to affirm the headset that it was God's order. Why? Because I read where Paul addressed them at the church of Philippi. And if Paul taught elders and deacons of Philippi and didn't instruct them in every other congregation, then he didn't teach the same thing in all the churches. One baptism suggests unto us that they were united in Christ, all were inducted into the family of God by the same process, by the same mode. But then there is another statement that Paul said. He said that there is not only one baptism, but he said that there is one spirit. That suggests unto us that there is unity of animation or unity of life. They, the thing that gave them the life, the thing that gave them uh, animation was the teaching of the spirit, the one Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did not move and direct and instruct some individuals to do one thing and other individuals to do some, something else. They were united in life. Godliness was taught at Ephesus and was taught at Philippi, it was taught at Colossae, and it was taught at uh, Philadelphia. They practiced the same thing again in how they lived, how they conducted their affairs in everyday life. 
Honesty is to be taught in, in South Carolina just like honesty is to be taught in California. Where you live does not change the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then finally Paul said that there is one hope. That suggests to us unity of desire or unity of expectation. That they all had, they were united in the one hope. That is, they had a united desire, they had a united expectation of heaven when this life was over. That's what they were looking for. They were looking for heaven. They were desirous of a city that has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. They were not all looking in different directions, somebody wanting something on this earth and somebody else looking toward heaven. That's the concept of the social gospel. The social gospel is the concept of what God has for mankind and what can be enjoyed by mankind is right here on this earth. And it's obvious that as people turn away and lose faith in the authority of the one Lord Jesus Christ and get away from the one faith, the message that sees worse than the one God, that they turn to the things of this life and the social gospel. And somebody has observed that the less spiritual a church is, the more recreation and entertainment they have to have, the more church peace that they have, the more entertainment and cooking that goes on. Somebody said that the early church met in the upper room, not in the supper room. Somebody else has observed that a church that is built around fried chicken and iced tea and ice cream is as dead as the chicken, cold as the uh, ice cream, as weak as the tea, and that's so. There, there's too many people that their idea of religion is their belly. Give them a good meal, and that's what religion amounts to them. And you just look. Go around over the country and look at the re religious organizations and their meeting houses. You look at this even in churches of Christ. You look at the churches of Christ that have been built in the last 20, 25 years. How many of them have kitchens in them? Well, our brethren worshiped 40, 50 years ago and didn't have one. Well, what's changed? Has the Word of God changed? Have we got a new revelation? Have we learned something that brethren didn't know? Were brethren, when I was born, when they preached the gospel, they didn't have kitchens in the meeting houses then. 